Right. <laughs> good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. My name is Elena Giannini, and I'm the Learning and Development Focal Point or co lead at the Alliance for Child Protection in Humanitarian Action. I'm really pleased to be here with you all today and joined by a wonderful um, group of content leads of speakers that you'll be meeting shortly. Um, I saw that some of you have already started to introduce yourself in the chat. Please continue to do so. I saw Mohamed from Somalia, I saw Anania from Zimbabwe, and uh, Konjit from Ethiopia, there is, and many more introducing themselves from all corners of the world. Um, our lovely producer today, Julie and Natalie, will also share a link shortly in the chat, like so that you um, can tell us where in the world you're calling us from today. And um, yeah, so let us know where you are. It gives us uh, a bit of a flavor of like whom we are talking to. And just a few more housekeeping before we get like into learning who our speakers are and mm, today. Thank you, Elena, and uh, welcome every participant to this uh, uh, useful session on localization. My name is Zerion Johannes. I am from War Child Holland in South Sudan. Thank you, Zerion. And uh, onwards to Simon. Simon, you are on mute, so maybe you need to click on there. Okay. Merci beaucoup, Hélène, pour cette Thank partie. you very much, Hélène, for this introduction. Thank you to all the participants. My name is Simon Kangeta, and I am the executive director of the local NGO called Ajedika, based in South Kivu. We work in child protection, especially for children impacted by armed conflict and vulnerable children. I'm also a member of the directing committee of child protection in humanitarian action. Thank you, Simon. Thank you very much, Elena. And it's great to join such a <coughs> large group of uh, participants today. So thank you all for the time. Good morning and good afternoon. My name is uh, Ben Munson and I uh, work with the Global Education Cluster as a localization specialist. So it's great to be here. Thank you, Ben. And Usain, can you introduce yourself? Yeah. Uh, hi everyone, uh, thank you so much on the beginning um, for this opportunity to be with you, uh, to talking about the localization. Uh, this is Hussein Abdullah from uh, BROB, the Iraqi organization, so the local NGOs uh, working uh, inside Iraq. Um, I'm the uh, focal point of BROB in the uh, strategic advisor group in the child protection of a cluster and also a coordinator for the working group on the local level inside of Iraq. Thank you. Wonderful. So we have speakers that are based in a variety of countries, South Sudan, Iraq, and DRC. So it's great to see the mix. I'm joined today also by Riyadh and Acheng. You can give a wave that are supporting this session and you'll meet them in another session for uh, the annual meeting as well. Thanks both for the moral support and help in setting up the session today. And now that uh, mm, we have all introduced ourselves, like it would be good, can we show the results, uh, producers, uh, for where we are in the world, like today, for everyone to see? And while the production works on this, uh, I just wanted to remind um, speakers to please speak slowly because the interpretation is ongoing um, today. And um, um, yeah, so to facilitate the work of interpreters, it's better to be to speak as slowly as possible. And I think the results are showing already. My apologies, like on your screens, and you'd see that the majority is actually from Africa, which is so pleasing to see. Uh, so we have forty percent of um, us based in Africa at the moment. Asia at twenty one percent. We have someone from Australasia, two percent. Europe thirty six. 36%, not many from North America and South America, because that's understandable. It's not a super friendly time for them. Right, with no further ado, I think I would like um, Zerion to take the floor and introduce their initiative like on capacity strengthening and localization. So over to you, Zerion, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you, Lena. Uh, my name is Zerion, I'm pro program implementation manager for War Child in South Sudan. 
I am going to briefly present uh, on our experience on localization of child protection in South Sudan. Uh, this localization initiative is supported by UNICEF and Dutch Relief Alliance as, as our key partners. Uh, the goal of uh, the localization initiative uh, as we are, uh, as we engage with local partners is mainly uh, informed by the, uh, the grand bargain commitment, as well as also uh, the Alliance localization uh, strategy which prioritize work, working with local actors as we respond to child protection issues uh, in humanitarian context. So uh, I am going to share uh, our experience working with, with our, our uh, local partners in South Sudan. Uh, as War Child, uh, we believe that local partners have the capacity and the resource and also uh, needed uh, connection and no networks with local actors, which may be uh, uh, making them uh, uh, effective in delivering child protection uh, services to local communities. Uh, so uh, our programming is also informed by uh, recognizing the, the local uh, actors' capacity in responding to child protection. Uh, issues in, in South Sudan. We can go to the next slide. Okay, uh, the overall goal in, in, in localization is uh, uh, to enhance technical and organizational capacity of our local partners through need-based uh, technical uh, support, provision of child protection implementation subgrants, followed by on-site supervision and coaching to make sure that uh, the, the sub-grants and also the, the technical support is translated into actual uh, results. Next slide. Okay, uh, uh, we have a specific process and the steps we follow as we roll out uh, the localization initiative. Uh, our basis for localization as an organization uh, is our partnership and localization policy and guidelines, which are uh, giving us clear uh, steps and procedures on, on how to start uh, localization or partnership, and also guiding the whole uh, implementation process. Uh, <clears throat> so, sorry, we, we start uh, uh, with open dialogue with local partners on partnership and collaboration opportunities. This can take competitive process in a form of like call for proposal, or it can be also targeted uh, partnership based on a clear uh, justification. Following that uh, open dialogue, we also do uh, pre-partnership organizational capacity assessment to understand uh, the capacity and also needs of our local partners, which will uh, give us a basis to design uh, our capacity development plan, as well as which informs our, our partnership approach with uh, uh, the local partners. Next slide. Okay, once we establish a partnership, uh, uh, or after signing a partnership agreement on the basis of the capacity assessment, we, we develop a joint capacity development plan, uh, which is addressing the needs of our local partners. And this capacity development uh, plan has two aspects. The first one is uh, the program component, focusing on child protection and uh, psychosocial support in this case. And we have also operational capacity development plan looking at mainly uh, finance, procurement, uh, uh, logistics, HR, and also other uh, operational aspects of capacity, which are very crucial to make sure that our local partners deliver child protection services uh, as per our agreement. Uh, on the basis of uh, our agreement, we provide implementation subgrants to our local partners to deliver child protection services to children in need. And we have also uh, uh, field supervision and coaching and follow up, which comes throughout the implementation process to make sure that our partners receive uh, required support to deliver services to children. Next slide. Okay, uh, okay. Uh, so 
as we work with our partners also, we have a process to document that we are uh, about the success of our partnership. Uh, the first, uh, uh, the first indicator is on our pre and post capacity assessment, which clearly uh, shows you, you know, where our partners are in terms of program and operation capacity for before partnership, we do that assessment. We also do that assessment after uh, maybe implementation of a specific program cycle. We do post assessment, assess, uh, uh, post partnership assessment and we do compare the results. So we have seen a number of uh, positive improvements on, on, on our partners in terms of their uh, child protection, psychosocial support, service delivery, in terms of their, their financial management practices on their HR system and also procurement. So this tool, uh, our assessment tool, as you can see, it, it shows you know, significant improvement uh, among our partnership, uh, our, our partners from the beginning of our partnership and also where we are at the moment. Uh, the, the evidence on changes also demonstrates as we see increase in funding signs of our partners and also the geographic coverage of their programs. So these are some of uh, uh, ways we measure how our partners are progressing in terms of you know, localization. And we have received very positive feedback from our partners also on, on the benefits they are gaining from this localization initiative implemented in South Sudan. Okay, this localization initiative is not uh, without challenge. We have some challenge related to especially uh, communities uh, and some also in some cases government stakeholders. There is a perception uh, by local community or authorities, you know, to prefer international actors as opposed to local actors. I think this is something related to misconception. Uh, there is also uh, our partners are facing a challenge to directly access funding from major donors. As we all know, local partners in most cases are accessing funding uh, through international organization. They don't have access directly to have funding from some major donors. So this is also a challenge we noted and uh, our local partners also have funding constraints to maintain basic operation and qualified staff. Uh, generally in, in localization initiative, we noted also the relationship between international actors and local partners is more of transactional. We just go to local partners for them to do an implementation or to do a job for us rather than, you know, real interest to build their organizational capacity and also their operational capacity to sustain a child protection programming in, in where we are operating. So these are some of the challenges flagged by our partners and also this is what we have seen in, in our operation. So we are trying to address this also as we progress in our localization initiative in South Sudan as War Child Holland. Thank you very much, Zerion, for your uh, presentation. That's great. And thank you for keeping us low face easy uh, for interpreters. We'll now move on to hear from Simon Kangeta from um, the, Repub the Republic Democratic the Democratic Republic of Congo. Over to you, Simon. Oui, merci beaucoup, uh, Helen. Thank you very much, uh, Helen. I do I apologize, I won't be able to uh, turn on my camera. I have a connection issue. So I'm a practitioner in child protection with almost 20 years of experience. In the fragile context, characterized by uh, recurring conflicts. Today, it is a real uh, honor to take the floor for a few minutes and explain our uh, common response uh, to this situation in the east of the DRC. So before mentioning this initiative, I would like also to uh, 
uh, give you a brief introduction to the uh, joint response, which is a program supported here by the Dutch government in cooperation with different uh, NGOs. In this uh, joint response, you have uh, different stakeholders being uh, NGOs, international NGOs, but also local and uh, national NGOs, including uh, here international NGOs. We have uh, World Vision, World Child Holland, Dutch Relief Alliance, which is also another uh, NGO supported by the Dutch government. Next slide, please. As I said, the purpose is also to support here the local NGOs to build capacities. So using these funds, Agedica, our organization, was able to organize different sessions to build capacities, including in logistics, in finance and accounting, and in nexus. Using here the same fund, we were able to supply equipment and material, such as uh, computers, tablets, bikes. Our organization also try to organize uh, a better support and having some activities generating uh, revenue. And this is why using the international funding, we implemented the revenue generating activities with the capacity building pack. And we were also able to create and design our strategic plan for five years. Next, next slide, please. Using this fund, we were able to conduct uh, some very practical activities with some key results. These key results can be summarized in two areas, the prevention and the response. For prevention, we started working and supplying uh, in centers and health centers, six in total, with uh, different equipments and developing playgrounds for children, safe playgrounds for children. We also organized uh, sessions explaining how you can uh, better apply the legal and international uh, framework when it comes to child protection. These workshops were also targeted to teachers. We were also able to connect with the non-state arm stakeholders for the monitoring and reporting mechanism. We also have the activities with the better protection, signing some roadmaps with the different stakeholders to promote here child safety and uh, uh, Pro prohibit uh, child recruitment. Next slide. The next slide is on our challenges. Challenges and limits are part of our work. And I think these challenges are related to, to uh, here, the location. And we really need uh, 
an involvement of uh, international stakeholders, as we often notice that for international stakeholders, after a while, they tend to change their goals or targets. So this long term is really required to have an effective joint response. We need this long-term involvement to solidify the results achieved through the different programs. Still in the challenges, we've also noticed that it's sometimes difficult to coordinate action, to coordinate funding, and to uh, involve local organization. There's very often a lack of uh, flexibility with this funding. There's also a lack of uh, capacities and opportunities for direct financing. And there's a lack of standardization at local level. So if you have, uh, for example, a, an international NGO, which would like to fund a local NGO, it's very difficult. I think we're all competing at the local level for the same funding from the same here international organizations. So I think we also need to raise awareness on what we called the great bargain agreement that would then make things easier in the ground. Because in practice, all these uh, international organizations do not necessarily release the funds because their requirements are not met. Next slide, please. Lessons learned. So there's been a very good coordination between all the different stakeholders. And here, this coordination is between the different stakeholders at government level, local authorities, uh, NGOs. And I think this is possible, but coordination is key. Second point, you need to take into account the risks and have a mitigation roadmap. And you will probably need also some financing of some actions to mitigate the risks. Third, you absolutely need to include all the stakeholders. So in our region, we need to include, for example, the non-state armed stakeholders for the prevention and for the response. And the last point here is you need to build capacities at local level. So during our sessions we organized, we were able to promote performance of local stakeholders, but also to promote performance to ensure better transparency and visibility on how the funds are managed. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Simon, for your presentation. That was uh, really great and to the time perfectly. Um, now that we have heard um, from these two examples of um, capacity strengthening partnerships between uh, uh, international NGOs and local NGOs uh, from Sudan and from DRC, I think like it's good to make the point of where localization sits like in the alliance strategy. So the screen is currently showing um, the goal of the of the strategy, which is priority number two, which is a total transformation of the sector with 
leading to a more intentional shift of power and resources to community, local and national actors. Um, so it's quite a big, big, big change that we aim to achieve. And certainly um, we're not quite there yet. Lots of room of improvement, uh, for room for improvement, which I was told yesterday, it's the biggest room in the world, <laughs> the room for improvement. So while I go through the objectives that sit under the localization priority for the Alliance, please feel free to post your questions in the chat and we will be able to address a few of them with um, Zerion and Simon before we look at the global perspective of what we do at global level for localization. Next slide, please. So uh, the objectives that are within the Alliance strategy uh, focus on a variety of aspects related to localization. The first one being the shift of power, the shift in funding. Next slide. And then like a more inclusive and diverse membership within the Alliance, as well as an accessibility um, uh, of the accessibility elements of the Alliance products. And then onwards, like uh, to the next slide, please, like, and obviously more meaningful participation. So power, inclusion, diversity, accessibility, funding, and participation are all elements of the localization. But today in this session, we would like to focus a little bit more on these last two elements, like of the second priority itself, which are more linked to capacity strengthening and the localization itself. And those being of creating and expanding opportunities to share, exchange and showcase learning knowledge and expertise amongst local community, <coughs> apologies, amongst community, local, national and international actors and across the child protection sector more broadly. And then expand and improve the accessibility and diversity of learning opportunities that uh, to strengthen child protection expertise and grow institutional capacity. So these two elements focus on capacity strengthening more prominently, which is obviously a big component of, of localization itself. Uh, if, we, if we really want to achieve it, like, you know, over the course of like a few years, I would say, um, but starting to engage liquidity immediately. Um, so I would like to, I see that there are questions um, coming up in the chat. Um, I'm appreciating the presentations that you have done. So one question that I am gonna to pose to both of you is what type of measures have been taken to um, ensure the transparency in the use of funds, like in both initiatives? And Serion, uh, um, maybe you can go first and then Simon, uh, you can go after. Serion. Can you hear us okay? I think You're Simon, can, <laughs> yeah, I know. We have okay. like, the, okay. Oui, Ellen, je pense que je peux okay. apporter. Vas-y, Simon. So I'm, I, may, I may just go first then. And to answer your question. So you were talking about transparency, reducing the risk when it comes to fund management. Based on our uh, experience and uh, with our partnership with the ELC, also a member of the consortium I presented earlier, for more transparency, you need training, training organized by the partners international partners for the local partners to clearly explain here the fund management mechanisms. So international partners organized a, a series of trainings, sessions on accounting, on logistics, 
and finance. We were also uh, given an SOP manual having different uh, procedures, and uh, we also we were audited by uh, the partner. We had a first uh, audit uh, at midterm and uh, another audit, a second one at the end of the project. Every time there was a request for more supplies, every time the international partner was making sure that the, uh, of, of the allocation of the funds. Thank you. Thank you, Simon Zerion. Not yet. It's not back yet. Okay. Um, before um, we move like to the next bit of the presentation, Simone, I wanted to ask one additional question, which is uh, what were the challenges that you have encountered, but more related to, to the capacity strengthening element? So um, what was your experience in that sense or, or that of your organization in the learning process? Thank you, Ellen, for your question. It is a very good question. Building capacity is essential. Specifically on the capacity strengthening, the main challenge was when there is a rotation in staff, when you have people leaving, people coming, because you can definitely build capacity and you then have people trained, you have this uh, knowledge disseminated, but after a few months, if you've got key people trained, living, and it's difficult because of course, the people you've trained now have this knowledge and they're kind of uh, looking for a better position in, within an international organization. And that's our main challenge. It's therefore a problem for a continuous need for capacity building. This just never stops. And at the local level, we don't have funding for that. And some international partners don't have uh, funding either for this uh, continuous training and uh, capacity building. So that's been our main uh, challenge over the last two uh, years within this partnership with the consortium. Thank you. That's a very interesting point around the retention of staff, like all capacity strengthening investments, like made in human resources when uh, there is actually fluidity in the and these resources moving from one organization to another, um, maybe seen as detrimental um, and um, to the organizations losing their their staff um, to others and you know moving on to international organization and that's like I think something that we should always be reflecting on when implementing programs on the ground um, especially as international actors right um, don't know if the room is connected again, but to do feel free to still ask questions for uh, Zerion and Simone to answer, and we'll try to ensure that we address them, if not live now at the end of the session, or uh, like via the chat function. I would like to call now uh, Ben uh, Manson from Save the Children to come on video and start their presentation on their and intervention. Thank you. Over to you. Thank you very much, uh, Elena. Um, and welcome again, everyone. Uh, great to hear the conversations uh, so far and the discussions from our colleagues. I think it's great to hear these clear examples and you know how at the country level these uh, initiatives are really moving forward. Um, and from a global perspective, we need to make sure that we are as attuned as, and as linked in to what's happening at the country level and learn from that so that the two aspects are, are connected. Um, Elena, can you just confirm that the presentation is up? Because I can't see it, just to confirm. It should be up in a minute. Okay, brilliant. Perfect.
Thank you very much. So as said, my name is uh, Ben Munson. I work with the uh, Global Education Cluster, which oversees uh, education responses around the world, um, working through uh, Save the Children, who are one of the lead agencies along with UNICEF. Um, and I'd also like to introduce who will be joining me in this uh, call today, uh, Hussein, who is the Deputy Board Director and Grants Manager of BROB, an organization based in Iraq, who will share lessons learned as well. And um, this presentation is about the benefits and challenges of intersector uh, localization efforts. So next slide, please. Thank you very much. Um, so over the last uh, year, um, there has been a group um, working on a set of tools and resources called um, the Localization in Coordination Toolkit. And this toolkit was um, designed and put together to be a resource to support localization efforts in the humanitarian cluster uh, system. Uh, to shift the power in coordination from the historic kind of internationally led to uh, more equitable uh, leadership and involvement uh, from national and local organizations. Um, so this uh, work has been going on um, by the um, Interagency uh, Standing Committee, uh, IASC, um, and they've been leading this work under Result Group 1 which came out of the 2016 Grand Bargain. So since the Grand Bargain was signed in 2016, there have been various work streams that have been uh, tasked with moving forward different parts of the Grand Bargain commitment. And under results group one, localization uh, was a high priority under that. So as part of that work stream, um, colleagues have been working together to move forward this initiative. And, um, the reason that we decided to bring together this uh, toolkit of tools, guides and resources is because <clears throat> at the country level and at the global level, there's been lots of very strong work on moving forward uh, the localization initiative and some key examples of how it's worked well, but there wasn't really much um, kind of consolidation of this work. And it was usually in a report online on a website and we wanted to have a single resource to bring these together so that it could be kind of a, a one-stop shop or a go-to resource for how to localize in humanitarian uh, coordination and from that we wanted the results of it to be able to increase meaningful participation of local and national organizations in the humanitarian program cycle and with the tools and the evidence and the kind of case studies that are involved in this toolkit, we wanted to equip national and local organizations to be able to advocate and be a leading part of this coordination. But we also wanted to, we, we know that this work is not just for national and local organizations to do, international organizations, but also cluster coordination um coordinators and the mechanism the humanitarian mechanism needs to do the work as well to bring uh, local and national organizations into the system uh, better as well so it's to equip uh, local and national organizations with the evidence to support their advocacy but also to equip um cluster coordinators on the methods and the ways that you can involve local and international local and national organizations into the humanitarian system uh, in a better and more equitable way um, next slide please okay so um i did at this stage want to introduce um hussein uh, who I believe will be giving a bit of an overview on what's worked well in uh, Iraq and the examples from Iraq at this stage. Oh, so, sorry, uh, uh, Hussein, I think you're after, after this slide, yeah, I think. Thank you um, so much. Uh... But, but please, please carry on. Sorry. Okay. Are you hearing me now? 
Yes, we can hear you, Stan. Do we need to go to the next slide then? Yeah, yeah. Sorry, I got the slides in the wrong order. If you can go to the next slide and then we can come back to... Um, sorry, Absolutely. It's the, no maybe worries, it's the one then. after this. After? Is there one more slide, maybe? Mm -hmm. Yeah. This is my last slide here. Okay, so yes. maybe the slide. So, so maybe we'll, we'll take a take a take a break. And say, same, would you like to just talk through uh, the, some of the experience you've had from the Iraq uh, context, please? Sorry, Hussein. Can you hear us? Yeah, I hear you. Uh, just a piece. Uh, I needed to show the slides on the screen. Hussein, are you going to share your slide on, on your screen? Because I don't have any other slides, I'm afraid. There was uh -huh. one okay. other slide that was, yeah, if you, if you could, um, I'll, I'll try and share my screen, Hussein. If you want to start speaking, I can try and share my screen. Okay, okay, no problem. Uh, thank you so much. Um, I will start into uh, talking about the localization uh, uh, experience in, in Iraq, and uh, maybe I will focus on uh something about uh, the challenging the uh, and also the the opportunity to the local ngos in, inside iraq um for um, why we are inside the localization initiative in in iraq um uh, why we are engaging in in, in this initiative um, the main the main reason of um, that we are inside the um, uh, localization initiative to train the technical capacity of uh, the national NGOs uh, in coordination and also in, in child protection uh, and humiliation action and also to train the uh, the institutional capacity of the national NGO to access to the sustainable fund also. Um, as a result, we needed to uh, to consideration that the national NGO must take the lead uh, in coordination uh, work because the national NG the international NGO and UN agencies is not to stay inside the country on uh, on the long time. Um, we needed to uh, to take the lead in, in coordination. Um, uh, inside the country, if we are uh, uh, taking about this uh, about the sustainability, um, and also uh, to improve the the national NGO to have the strength capacity for the coordination and uh, to prepare it in case uh, uh, of any new crisis to be to be ready uh, to any new uh, crisis inside the country. Um, also, that the sustainable funding contribution greatly to strengthening the organizational capacities uh, internally in, in terms of uh, institutional buildings, as well as to attracting and uh, sustaining uh, expertise. Um, for, for the experience of the uh, localization in, in, in Iraq, I will talking about some of the challenging uh, uh, of that. And the first one, um, it's uh, um, as our colleague mentioned in, in South Sudan and uh, also in other countries, it's the, I think it's the, uh, the same issues about the limited resources and uh, underfunding for the national NGOs. In fact, this is the uh, biggest concerning and challenging uh, for the national NGOs in general for all uh, organizations due to the uh, changing of uh, the priority of uh, the global funding on general and also on the local uh, uh, on the local level about the, uh, changing the priorities between time to time. And uh, also uh, because um, the crisis it's, uh, is different and maybe uh, it show a new crisis in, in some countries, uh, as you know. And also with the lack of supporting from, uh, from the private sector and the government to, to the non-profit organization inside the countries. I'm uh, talking especially uh, in the case of, uh, of Iran. Uh, also, the lack of effectively uh, involved of the national organizations in, in the human generation coordination system. This is 
is one of the big uh, challenge. Uh, maybe we have uh, we uh, we have uh, some organizations uh, <coughs> involved in the coordination system, but uh, when we're talking about the big picture of uh, all the national organizations inside Iraq, um, uh, some of organizations, uh, uh, most of organizations, it's not uh, inside the coordination uh, coordination system. Um, um, also, there are uh, many of national organizations um, at a high level in, in the human relation coordination system. Uh, they remain so far not uh, within the, uh, the level that uh, we deserved. Um, the last challenging that I needed to talk about is the lack of experience of national or organization in, in the sectoral of coordination, not all organization, uh, as I mentioned, but we, we have, um, uh, because of the crisis that's uh, faced in, in, in Iraq, we have uh, uh, some of our organization uh, have a good experience and benefited from the crisis and uh, from the experience of, uh, national, of international NGO and UN agencies, and uh, now they have um, a good experience in in, uh, in coordination system, but on on overall, it will be uh, it's uh, it's a challenging for the other national organizations. When we're talking about uh, the opportunity and the recommendations that uh, uh, we can take it from the localization initiative in Iraq, uh, I think we needed to uh, provide uh, unconditional uh, funding for programs. Uh, to the national NGO through which uh, uh, to uh, can build their capacities and allocate some of funding to uh, support the sectoral of the coordination of uh, coordination <clears throat> and also building the partnership with um, with national organizations it's uh, maybe it's a good idea to build their capacities as well as the uh, national NGO uh, requiring a, low, a lower cost of uh, in the implementation of uh, of projects and the programs in, in uh, comparing with the international NGOs or or UN agencies. Uh, also, recognizing the role of national NGO in making a difference in human relation crisis, uh, especially to uh, when we're talking about the issues of access to. Uh, to the risk area and uh, uh, maybe the national NGO have uh, a big space to, uh, of the moving and uh, coordinations on the on the local level inside the, uh, the Iraq. Uh, providing more technical, uh, also we needed to providing more technical resources uh, in, in, in the local language, not uh, not uh, just in, in English language, like we, need, we needed to uh, working on the Arabic and the Kurdish uh, language, as well as providing the translation at uh, the high level of meetings in, in to, uh, to the local language in order to provide the assistance uh, to more members uh, of national organization to participate actively in, in, in this meeting and uh, to give the opportunity to them to uh, improve their experience and uh, uh, maybe we are talking about uh, some of organizations that not have uh, a global language, not uh, participants in, in the maybe of uh, uh, training of capacity building to, to organizations or uh, uh, the high level uh, meetings because of the issues of language. We needed to uh, focus more about um, the, the resources and uh, providing the translation to the local uh, local uh, language. Uh, this is all from my side. Uh, thank you so much for listening um, and uh, over to you, Ben. Thank you so much, uh, Hussein, for that. And I think it really um, uh, shows, you know, having that um, learning from that kind of country and, and perspective to inform these global tools is so so useful. And, and the experience that Hussein was talking about fed into the creation of this toolkit. So from this toolkit process, we um, kind of documented some of the key benefits and key successes um, that we saw. Uh, in terms of coaching, uh, um, we saw that lots of um, national actors were able to benefit from shadowing and gaining experience from 
uh, UNICEF or Save the Children uh, coordinators who are in uh, positions of coordination through key processes such as the H&O process and the HRP process. And one of the challenges we highlighted was the lack of experience of these national actors. So from doing that shadowing, they were able to gain this experience to give them the confidence and, and, and training to be able to take on leadership positions uh, afterwards. Additionally, there was lots of feedback that um, having better uh, information sharing within country clusters improved the involvement of national and local organizations into the cluster system. And some good examples were where some country teams created dedicated Skype groups for their cluster and local and national actors found that kind of constant way of communicating with the cluster uh, an easier access point than just over email or face to face meetings. Um, Additionally, uh, it, it, as, as so mentioned in Iraq and also South Sudan, uh, national actors have taken on leadership roles in the majority of the sub-national coordination groups. And this has the opportunity to, again, continue to build that experience in coordination of uh, for local and national organizations. However, we still want to look to create opportunities at the national level as well as the, the sub-national level. Um, and in Nigeria, the child protection uh, subsector was able to create uh, that opportunity for a national organization to take on that opportunity of co-leadership position. And they've been in that role for the last uh, year and a half during the COVID period. And that was really beneficial because it allowed uh, continuation of leadership of the child protection subsector throughout the whole COVID period, rather than having a gap of six or nine months where the co coordinator wasn't in, in position. And then finally, this toolkit allows for a standardized way of working and, and standardization of best practices before, as I said, the resources were there, but they were spread out and they were not consolidated. And this gives a kind of guidance note to where the resources are for better involvement of local and national um, organizations in the humanitarian coordination system. Um, so that's uh, a quick overview on that. And then we'll just go to the final slide. So we've got the, you know, uh, the lo um, localization in coordination uh, guidance tool, which was created last year by the, 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 the working group. But what are the next steps? Well, um, the clusters received some funding uh, this year to be able to pilot some of these approaches that were documented into the uh, toolkit at the national level. We, the experience and the learnings came from the national level into this guidance note, but we now want to kind of roll out the testing of how does this toolkit support better coordination and leadership from national and local organizations. So the, um, the, educate, sorry, the education cluster, the nutrition cluster, the child protection AOR, and also the WASH cluster are currently working together across all of those four clusters to pilot um, this toolkit in uh, four countries. And we're still in finalization of those countries, but they're looking like Nigeria, South Sudan, Iraq, and Afghanistan. And the project will run until March next year, and it will build on the previous experience and kind of a best practice on how to increase coordination of local actors. And we're aiming to learn what works well and what doesn't work well so that we can use these case studies to further strengthen this toolkit so that it can be rolled out to other countries after that. Um, okay, I think that's, uh, is it the last slide or is there one more? I think it's the last slide, yeah. So um, yeah, thank you very much. We still know there's a lot of challenges to involvements uh, of national and local actors in the humanitarian coordination system. We know that funding is a, a massive barrier to be able to attend these meetings and, and be actively involved in the response. And we need to make sure that the coordination system is providing more avenues for funding, direct funding to local and national organizations, as Hussein was saying. We also know that there's limited experiences historically for local and national organizations to lead coordination mechanisms. So we need to create those opportunities in a more sustainable way. 
And then finally, we know in humanitarian response, it's always a very rapid response. And therefore, often localization gets deprioritized for the, you know, the, the needs and, and the, the competing priorities. So we need to make sure that when we design responses and the way you respond to humanitarian uh, crisis, localization is mainstream rather than just an afterthought. So thank you very much. Thank you, Ben, and thank you, Stan. Thank you both. Um, that was very insightful. And I think that you have um, answered one of the questions that was uh, coming through the chat around coordination that was posed by Jonas. So I think we have addressed that like uh, in quite some details. There are uh, normally we would jump into a breakout room work. Like I would just give like another five minutes, like uh, to answer a few questions to the to the speakers today because there are a couple that I find um, really interesting. So I was wondering, uh, Ben, if you could take one question, which is in countries where the involvement of national NGOs is very limited in humanitarian context how to build the capacity of local government to proactively engage informal community groups. A I think that's challenging a very good, one. <laughs> very good question, very good question. I think the humanitarian response in any context fails if it doesn't engage um, you know, local action. I think that can be community level groups or engaging with community that can be local government that can be local and national organizations so i think although when we think about the localization response we think of local and national organizations mainly i think you know any of those parties where available should be brought into the conversation so i think you you might use this a very similar approach for uh you know supporting local government but also you know most communities have representation in some form whether that's a, a small community-based group or an association so you may just need to ensure that your mechanisms of engaging these groups and these um, communities is more the cluster proactively reaching out and we see it in some countries where the cluster is you know it, it's mainly in the capital and, and expects organizations to come to them I think in contexts like you were describing we need to make sure the cluster is proactive and is reaching out and doing more community outreach to engage these groups. That's my that's my initial thoughts. Elena, you're muted. Oh, I'm so sorry. Thank you very much, Ben. I think that was a great answer. And uh, Simon or Zerion, would you like to contribute uh, to that? Um, question, which is how to build the capacity of local governments to proactively engage in formal community groups. Yeah, I see Zerion uh, is coming live. Thank you, Zerion. Go ahead. OK. Thank you, Lena. Yeah, I think based on our experience here, uh, when we say localization, it's not only about local uh, NGOs or civil society organization, it also encompasses uh, government actors. So in all our efforts, uh, we involve government social workers and also uh, government staff from Ministry of Education and from justice sector who are uh, directly you know, connected with our, our child protection programming. So we have a, a training designed for local authorities to understand as well as lead child protection response in, in their uh, locality. So uh, I, 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 I want to also add this uh, aspect, which is not also addressed in our presentation. Yeah. Great. Thanks, Azarion, for your contribution. Simone, would you like to come in on that question as well? Because I think it's quite a key one around you know, how we work with governments, how we, how we build, how we strengthen the capacity of like governments in liaising with these informal groups. I cannot oui, see uh, merci beaucoup, Alain, Thank, pour cette question. Thank you very much, Elena, for this uh, question. From our experience with activities especially with children affected by uh, armed conflicts. We work in coordination with uh, state actors and we have the 
execution unit of demobilizing, helping us to go face uh, these non-state uh, armed actors who are recruiting children. After that, we use technical services of the state, uh, the social affairs division, for example, to uh, tackle the follow-up of activities linked to how to reintegrate these children in the community. So we have specialists and uh, social workers of the government who are involved and uh, help us to respond to children needs in particular uh, what regards, uh, as regards to dignity, for example. We have uh, kits to strengthen capacities for these actors to involve them thank you very much thank you simon for your answer there are a few questions i think like the chat like it's uh, becoming active um i am uh, gonna pose these difficult questions from Milia um uh, to you ben because you have just spoken about the localization toolkit so sorry to put you under the spotlight a little bit and then we'll move into the breakout room there is another very interesting question from marcello viola which i think it's uh, very pertinent to capacity strengthening in particular but i'll let you take this one then we'll move into breakout rooms might the cluster system in some context even be an obstacle to localization is the humanitarian system equipped to facilitate the localization that's a very big I think it could be a debate in itself. So yep. maybe just a few words, Ben, on this. Sure. I, I think it's a very good question. And I think uh, the answer is, is, is unclear at this stage. I think as a first initial response, I would say that the humanitarian cluster system has a purpose and it's to ensure that the, the best humanitarian response possible. However, I do think there's a lot of learning that the cluster system has to do to be able to really and properly ensure that it is sustainable and it is engaging local and national organizations in a meaningful way, because at the moment, in many cases, it's not doing that or not doing that well enough. So I would say that it's it can be a barrier, but it has the opportunity to be a massive enabler of localization. So I think that the, the, the task that the cluster teams have is how to ensure that we are supporting the transition uh, and sustainability of this response with, with more national and local organization in, involved. And maybe very quickly, I think it relates to Marcello's point. And if you haven't read it in the chat, I recommend you read it. But to Marcello's point, I would just say that I see a lot of organizations doing this too. I think there are so many local and national organizations that are calling out for support and funding and if a international organizations thinking about setting up locally before they even think about that they should be thinking how do we support what ex already exists and as what already is there in country because there are usually hundreds if not thousands of organizations that already exist so that's my first thoughts on those things Thanks, Ben, and thanks to all the speakers. They'll be staying with us. I'd like to center us to center us all back and to try and narrow down this big uh, pot that is localization because that's like a very big, you know, thematic area. Like it's a very big, like and challenging like thing to achieve. And as I was saying at the beginning, even in the alliance strategy, there are many components components to it, the power dynamics and the shift thereof, the addressing diversity, inclusion, accessibility, et cetera. Come back on the focus of this one session, which is more on capacity strengthening and localization. And I would like to kindly ask the producers to post, to, to paste in the chat, if you can, the two objectives like of the strategy on um, on capacity strengthening specifically, which are create and expand equitable opportunities to share, exchange, and showcase the learning, knowledge, and expertise amongst community, local, national, and international actors across the child protection sector. And improve and expand accessibility and diversity of learning opportunities to strengthen child protection, technical expertise, and grow institutional capacity. So I would like you all now, or you will receive an invite shortly to join breakout rooms. 
and uh, you will be able to access the desk invite and be moved to, to breakout rooms and you will be made available virtual whiteboard. Every breakout room has a number assigned and you will be able to work on the number assigned to your um, whiteboard. So if your group number one, if your breakout room number one, you will be working on whiteboard number one. If your breakout room number two, you will be working on uh, virtual whiteboard number two and so forth. Uh, please, if you need interpretation, could you please rename yourself with an asterisk at the end of your name so that we know that you will need the support like with uh, uh, interpretation. And once you're in these breakout rooms, we would like you to answer one big question, which is, or provide a suggestion. We don't want you to answer. We would like you to discuss and provide us suggestions and note them on the sticky notes on what can the Alliance still do in terms of improving its localization efforts in capacity strengthening. So what can we do better to ensure that our capacity strengthening efforts are um, localized enough? So you should be receiving breakout rooms invitations very shortly. You have the Jamboard link in your uh, chat, and I hope like you uh, get lively in those discussions and input away. We will definitely take in consideration. Elena, sorry to yeah. interrupt. Can I just check? Do you want them open for 15 minutes or less? Uh, 10 minutes. 10 minutes. You got it. OK, everyone, off you pop. I will be jumping as well as the other speakers and content leads into the various groups so that we'll be able to um, help you if you have any questions. Lovely. And everyone who is remaining here, this is your breakout room and feel free to take advantage of the interpretation channels if you'd like. Also feel free to turn your video cameras on and unmute yourselves. Elena, everyone's in their rooms now, if you'd like mm -hmm. to uh, kick off the conversation here, maybe. Yeah. Um, can I see the part? Okay, see, so yes. Um, Ahmed, Alex, Andrea, Miriam, Jonas, you're all here in this room with me. Um, I'm happy to be chatting with you away about around this question. And if you want to make any suggestions on the question that we posed around um, how to make um, our capacity strengthening efforts uh, better to achieve localization. Oh, sorry, I'm a, you're an interpreter. Okay, don't worry about me. <laughs> um, bonjour, tout le monde. Bonjour, Miriam. Hi, Miriam. How are you doing? Hello, everyone. My name is Miriam from La Sublime Organization. We are a young organization created about a year ago. We are based in Switzerland and also in a DRC. We take care of uh, child protection, but I personally am a huge supporter uh, of uh, child protection. Uh, I am a lawyer, also a, a judge at the um, Kinshasa uh, court. So I wanted to contribute regarding your question because yesterday, we also tried to talk about education. I think that capacity strengthening must start um, really early with teachers because child protection is not a, a, a module in curriculums. So if we could have advocacy so that young children could know their rights and strengthen the knowledge of teachers in academic because law and child protection isn't part of the curriculum. So this is what I wanted to say. I think that at university in 2015, I uh, advocated for this module to be part of the curriculum, but I left that um, courses in 2015. I don't know if it was implemented, but my suggestion was that if we could do advocacy actions in 
DRC so that uh, law and children rights could be included as courses. And I think that's what uh, would allow people to give their best. So that was my contribution. Polarization and the greatest achievement in terms of um, education, like it's certainly like even broader than localization itself, right? Um, so that's definitely like a, a good point. I will try to add it to one of the gem boards that we are using. Anyone else who would like to share thoughts and su suggestions? I ah, see, Jonas, you have your end up. Please go ahead. Yeah, Jonas has this uh, Bonjour à tous. <laughs> Merci beaucoup pour ces points de vue que Miriam vient de donner. Thank Donc, you. Thank you very much. I agree with uh, Miriam. And I agree. Promoting the uh, standards and the minimum standards is very important. And you're right. And when I say minimum standards, I also mean the rights. And I believe uh, this uh, should be promoted as early as possible, including in the education and see maybe why and how in some universities we can clearly promote child protection. And I believe that we are going to continue our cooperation, but we are already thinking ahead of time as I believe that in July, we will have some uh, meetings with the dean of the universities to try to promote uh, CPMS. But it's important also to use universities for what they are, that is to say research centers, so we can have the evidence we need and that evidence that could be used by uh, ONGs or by government and uh, decision makers to implement policies. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jonas. That's a very important point, like about, you know, including child protection into the universe academic curriculum. And it's something that the LND working group is uh, trying to pin down at the moment for the Alliance. So we are conducting a bit of a research to find out what, um, it's out there in terms of academic collaboration between uh, NGOs and universities, and also to scope potential models for future cooperation for the Alliance. So there is um, an effort ongoing in those terms, Jonas. Um, and we hope to involve like you know, we will be sharing those like outcomes of those conversations and like, you know, make recommendations of what it's gonna be coming next, but yes. Anyone else would like to add additional thoughts or suggestions on how we better keep our national colleagues to play a more important role or the role in? Yes, Darion, go ahead. Yeah, uh, thank you, Lena. Just I want to mm -hmm. add one point. Uh, yeah. Like we when we say we need to we need to deliver high quality child protection service in a humanitarian setting, like in a rapid operational uh, operational environment. There is a tendency to see localization as like uh, a challenge to achieve that goal because we think local partners are challenged to you know, provide high quality service and mm. especially in, in this uh, humanitarian context. So it looks like we have two contradictory objectives which needs maybe clearly articulating really how we want to address both. In, in my opinion, I think these both objectives can be achieved as far as we put in, pl in place a clear mechanism, you know, to ensure high quality services as well as to ensure localization is um, uh, uh, implemented as committed. So I am, I am thinking these two objectives are not like in conflict. We can achieve both uh, in, in humanitarian settings. That's great. 
very valid points, Arion. Thank you for your contribution. Please do not your thoughts down in one of like the jam boards because I'm not able to capture everything at the same time. I saw someone else with the hands up. Um, Aziz, Aziz, I'm hoping to pronounce your name correctly. Hello. Hi, Aziz. Please go ahead. Okay. Uh, thank you. Uh, regarding uh, like how to enhance the national way of uh, protecting or advocacy of child protection localization uh, in Yemen, uh, UNICEF had conducted uh, a pioneer uh, of the national leg legislations with the CBCs and the community leaders. Uh, we have to, we had conducted uh, so many trainings so to, uh, to introduce child protection issues in the community, then we take their opinions and train and to enhance their like participation uh, through a set of uh, TOT trainings or trainings for adolescents. Uh, this made a great effort to enhance the national system. So most of the people now understand how to reveal, for example, cases, how to deal with the um, uh, abuse, how to uh, like to know what the misconducts of the child protection issues, uh, how to work with local committees as uh, a safeguarding committees or something like that. Great, Aziz, and please, uh, if you can go into one of like the jam boards and note your suggestion down in one of uh, like the sticky notes, that would be great. And um, yes, we can, I guess, close the breakout rooms for everyone. Unfortunately, the time is limited and I wanna have the time to thank everyone uh, production if we can bring everyone back. Um, yep, the rooms will be closing in 43 seconds. Thank you very much. Thank you all in this uh, room for um, contributing. And as I said, like feel free to continue making notes in the Jamboard. I think the link is still available in the chat like um, above. So you can just click on it and choose a whiteboard and stick your thoughts in them uh, on the sticky notes and we'll be able to look at them with Katie and uh, you know, to do our best to actually direct the Alliance in the right direction in terms of localizing capacity strengthening. We we'll just wait now for everyone to be back. We're back. Ooh, yes, everyone is back or is getting back. Welcome back, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for um, participating in those discussions. I hope that was fruitful and that you got to speak with some colleagues. And um, we we don't we starting to have some face to face interactions again, um, but not as many as uh, we would want to. But um, I hope that the session was helpful. I want to thank the speakers, the production interpreters, and everyone that has worked on it, and everyone who has participated today for their contribution. Um, you, the annual meeting goes on, so there is plenty like uh, uh, of stuff coming up. So let me just. Uh, uh, look it up for you, but basically at the end of this session, when I am up, like you will be able to join like a casual discussion on, a, on the infographic uh, gallery that we have available on the community of practice. So those that have posted, like, uh, you know, made their initiatives into nice infographic will be there for you to answer questions, etc. So do join in case you're available. Um, the discussion will go on, like, or will be available, like, up until the next session will start, which is another uh, super interesting session around the latest releases from uh, the Alliance, the Out of the Press, and then a table talk with the uh, uh, working group and task forces on um, integrated programming and all of that. So there is, and there are more sessions in the afternoon as well, but this is what's coming up right at the end of like, this session. Um, um, yeah, that is all from my side. So thank you all very much for participating. And again, please don't forget like to uh, join the discussions coming up and the events later in the day. So lovely to see you all and um, yeah, to the to to the rest of the annual meeting for today. Take care. Thank you. Ciao, fiamma. Ciao, everyone. Thank you.